That's good. All righty. So the title of tonight's talk is um, How to Become a Neighborhood Tree Ambassador. And there's a multiple number of ways that you can do that for your given neighborhood. And we want to do that. We want the reason why we're presenting this is we want to really activate and energize people in their own neighborhood to begin thinking about and noticing and taking action about trees in their neighborhood. So that's uh, there's multiple ways to do that. And that's what um, tonight's uh, talk is about. So Walk a Million Trees project, we've been around, as I said earlier, for about a, a, a year and a half now. Uh, we have a three-part mission um, to plant, protect, and connect. And so uh, on the planting side, it's planting trees wherever feasible within Whatcom County. We have hands-on work parties at this time of year, all the way through, you know, pretty much into deep winter. Uh, we've got um, two or three work parties a month. Um, and then we are always are reaching out to businesses for business partnerships to um, work together on, on projects as well. And then we have the protection piece, which is all about protecting the mature trees that we have already, because climate action um, you know, really requires both planting and protecting in terms of sequestering additional carbon in the atmosphere and building up um, greater resilience to the climate issues in our community. Um, the tree, the mature trees that we have now are grabbing the carbon now and the trees we plant really need about a couple of decades before they really kick into serious gear about carbon and, and habitat benefits. So we focus on mature, protecting mature trees in the neighborhoods and key watersheds. Uh, we do a lot of policy advocacy in the background, which I'll tell you a little more about later on. And, um, and then of course we remove tree killing invasives such as English ivy, um, which we'll also talk about uh, in more detail later. And then the final uh, piece of our uh, mission is to connect people to the immense multifaceted value of trees and forests. Um, you know, it's lots of people think trees are beautiful, and yeah, maybe they understand they capture carbon and give us fresh air, but there's a whole host of other benefits that um, I will show you um, that trees do for us. Uh, and so we hold community events uh, and special events such as this um, to educate the public about trees. Uh, next month, we have um, a uh, two nights that we're going to be in the Pickford's October documentary month series. And we're going to be presenting the film. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> spacing on the name of the film. Um, I, <laughs> I will get to that later on. I'll, I'll Elemental. It. Elemental, of course. <laughs> well, thank you for that, whoever said that. So. Yeah, it's, it's all about redefining our relationship with fire. It's an outstanding film, very amazing and jaw dropping, but it has all this amazing science in it about um, uh, that, that challenges preconceptions about how fire interacts with homes. Um, and that's an increasingly important issue in our region, as we all know, as we recently have, have had uh, relatively nearby uh, wildfires although relatively small here. Um, and so anyways, uh, we hope you will come out for those Pickford events and all the uh, information about that is on our website um, at walkamilliontrees.org. So with all that said, that's our three-part mission. And then it's like, why are we doing that three-part mission? It's to address uh, the climate and biodiversity crisis. We have two of those crises going on among numerous other crises, of course, but trees directly help both of these at the same time. And it also uh, enhances the health and resilience of our local communities very directly. And, we'll, and we'll, I'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So now the question is why become a neighborhood tree ambassador? And we're gonna go through several reasons why, and I'm gonna um, explain a little more about that. So the first thing is trees do provide multiple benefits to all of us. 
we, um, this is a graphic from the American Forest um, uh, uh, in, uh, nonprofit. And you can see here the kinds of health and stress reduction uh, benefits and clean air and safety buffers and cooling benefits that trees naturally provide uh, in the urban context in particular. Um, and they, you know, of course, also add beauty to our communities. Um, but the benefits are very, very real. Um, it's not like just, uh, you know, vaguely noticeable things or, or intangible benefits that, that uh, seem unclear. It's, you'll, if you spend time in the urban context with trees, you will definitely uh, notice their benefits, especially in the hot summers that we have. So trees, besides providing what was on that prior um, image, also do all of these things. Uh, it captures carbon, it gives habitat and diversity for numerous animals and pollinators. Um, it supports the aquatic riparian habitats near streams uh, that we have running throughout our city. And then here's some of the less subtle ones that people don't realize. It reduces stormwater needs and flooding. Um, trees play a big role in, in reducing flooding. And that's something that I'll talk more about shortly. Um, but we've been experiencing that in our own community and parts of our community, as, as you probably know. The trees stabilize slopes. And then when they're properly placed next to buildings, they can save energy by cooling buildings during hot summers. And of course, they're effective buffers from traffic when done, when planted properly and densely. And they give us natural areas to explore and enjoy. And they, of course, beautify our community and improve our community's quality uh, of life. So that's all about the benefits. So now here's the hard facts, which is unfortunate. We're losing tree canopy now. And so um, that's another reason to become a neighborhood tree ambassador. Here's a, a map, it's, about, um, it's from the city, and it shows the 2013 LIDAR images um, of where um, existing forests are. And of course, you know, if you contrast this to say Southern California or something like that, or Eastern Washington, we do have a lot of trees. And one of the first um, questions I get from people um, are uh, when, when I talk with people about our nonprofit is, is that, well, don't we have plenty of trees already? And the answer is, yeah, we have a lot of trees, but what's happening over time is that we're losing trees, particularly in our Bellingham urban context. So this is an image here that's from the city's uh, urban forestry uh, management plan process, which is currently underway. And it's a more updated, uh, LIDAR image uh, showing in five acre grids, uh, whether there's gain or loss between 2006 and 2018. Now the city's report inadvertently uh, uh, made the yellow and orange very dim. So it really looked um, like there wasn't much of that. What we've done here is evened out the saturation for all the loss figures uh, compared with the um, gain figures. So you can more easily see where there's been tree loss during this period. And the tree loss has continued. And this is a equities, tree equity score map. Um, it kind of gives a similar picture. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's several central neighborhoods in particular that do not have as many uh, trees as other neighborhoods, uh, particularly the lettered streaks in York neighborhood, but also all the ones you see uh, in the uh, lighter um, gray blue. Now, uh, Meridian and Cordata, or, or Cordata especially used to be in the lighter shade like that. And it's changed quite a bit because the city has done uh, quite a number of plantings as, as developments have occurred up there. So that, that's, that's an example. And then also you see on the bottom part of this image that um, uh, Happy Valley and uh, down through the, you know, Fairhaven and stuff, they're fairly on the high score. And Happy Valley, for instance, has been doing uh, many years of active tree planting in their neighborhood. So they're reaping the benefits um, of that effort. 
So the third reason why um, to become a, a neighborhood tree ambassador is that our urban trees are dying from invasives and stress. It's not just that there's tree removal from development, um, uh, it's also invasives and stress. And one of the big ones is English ivy, which I will talk in detail about um, further. Uh, but this is just two images. The one on the left actually is a tree in my own yard. I happen to live next to a little creek that feeds in the lake pad. And, and I didn't understand tree ivy myself until the last couple of years um, before I started you know, this nonprofit. I thought, oh, cool, it's climbing up the tree. That's kind of cool, it's interesting <laughs> uh, green look. Um, and had no idea that once it would reach up in the canopy, it would kill the tree as it did in this one where it, it basically the tree decayed and it rotted out. Um, and then uh, the top you know, windstorm was knocked off and this is what we have left. So uh, invasive ivy, English ivy, is um, once it gets up in the canopy, almost 100% will kill uh, the tree. Uh, what's, but it's a, a kind of a silent, slow killer because it takes a handful of years for it to usually work up the, up the tree trunk. And uh, it diminishes the tree's strength uh, during that time, but not enough to be very noticeably different. But once it gets in the canopy, that's when it's doomsday for the tree. So that's one of the big invasives we have here. Um, we have been inventorying uh, numerous city parks as a first effort to get a handle on just how much English ivy is set up on mature trees here. And already we have counted well over a thousand trees uh, in both city parks and also in, in the greenway areas. And, there's, and we haven't even inventoried half of the area yet. So the fourth reason is we need tree advocacy to catch up. So look at all the cities on the left that have enhanced tree protections for their, in their community. And look at us without enhanced tree projection, protections. Bellingham, Ferndale, and Blaine. We're behind the times. All the cities on the left, uh, as long as 10 years ago, enacted enhanced tree protections for their urban canopy. So, uh, you know, as you probably know, the city is in the middle of its urban forestry um, management plan uh, consultants process, which is a three year process. Um, and so um, we're in the middle of it now, that they are, I should say. And there's about a, a year and a half more to go. Uh, possibly longer. It looks like there's been some delay in, in some of the middle steps. Um, but anyways, we got quite a ways to go. And then of course, there'll be more time for local policymakers to review and decide what to do once they get that information. So that time is uh, going on and on. And meanwhile, we're losing more and more trees in our urban fabric. And I'm talking about Bellingham here in this, this instance, but it's also happening uh, elsewhere in the county. Further out in the county, it's more about uh, logging and development. Um, while in the city, it's more about urban stresses and ivy, and then also some development as well. So this is just another um, image that shows uh, where the city's at with their process. They're in phase two. Uh, this is an old, older graphic from them. It's, they showed winter or spring of 2022 um, to uh, wrap that up. Um, it looks like uh, you know it's more going to be winter, or spring 2023. It seems, or at least early winter. So there, it's a little bit behind right now. And then there's the whole phase phase three process to go through. The good part is the city's been pretty um, active about. Uh, getting community feedback. Um, and that's going to be one of the things I mentioned later about how as a tree ambassador, it's important for you to give feedback and efforts like that. And um, as I mentioned, you know, especially now that we're out of COVID, development permits have accelerated and more tree canopy loss will occur. So inaction, um, waiting this long time is causing significant harm to our community. 
what we as a nonprofit has been, have been trying to do is to um, work behind the scenes to see if we can get some interim um, tree rules um, established uh, you know, before the, the full master plan report is done. Uh, time will tell for successful of that, but we are working on that. And here's some examples of some of those developments. You may be aware that on Meridian, um, right uh, to the side, on the Meridian side of the Bellingham Golf and Country Club, and just a little bit uh, east of Cordata Park is the area in orange there, which is uh, a development being proposed uh, for about, um, I think it's, uh, oh gosh, forgetting now, but I wanna say like 62 infill um, condos. And um, the development plan as it stands basically wipes out that entire strand of trees. There's no nature integrated development or anything like that. It just is a pretty much a clear cut through there. As you can see in the scale of the image, you know, imagine if, if, uh, if someone said, well, we're gonna wipe out about you know, a fourth or so of the trees in Cornwall Park. It would probably be a huge community outcry. This is just across the street from that, and the trees are just as old as what you see in Cornwall Park. So this is one of the development proposals that um, we're tracking very carefully, where we feel that the, uh, there can be um, a much more integrated design that is both meeting some um, infill need for the city, but also uh, not clear cutting the site and instead you know, integrating really well with the mature, amazing trees that are there. And likewise, some of you may, may have seen the uh, yard signs that have been up in various parts of the community about the Mud Bay Cliffs project. That's a uh, 38 home luxury home development that's above the cliffs um, that are very rugged and scenic click, uh, cliffs. Uh, something that um, actually an area that if you go down there in low tide, it's a walk that uh, I would imagine most uh, people from Bellingham or, or the surrounds have not done. It's kind of this hidden gem there, uh, but it's pretty heavily forested on the cliff with um, mature trees. And uh, the development proposal as it currently stands um, comes very close, um, we, we feel, to the edge of the cliff and has numerous impacts on both uh, the trees and the cliff and the bay below. Uh, so we are tracking that one very carefully too. So um, you as a neighborhood tree ambassador uh, can also be a part of tree advocacy efforts. And in the latter half of this presentation, I'll show you more specifically why. But um, the fifth reason to do it, um, to, to be a tree ambassador is to build climate resilience and make a positive impact. So as you know, we've been having uh, record floods lately um, uh, due to uh, atmospheric rivers uh, events. Uh, and we, it looks like we have a La Nina occurring again this year. So we may very well see floods in parts of our community in the coming months again. Um, and even, you know, like over in, this is a picture from in Western and stuff. So it's numerous places in our community. It's not just up by the Nooksack that are impacted by this. And trees can play an important role in greatly reducing uh, and evening out those, those um, potential flood waters. And then on the converse side, we just got through this summer and we had um, heat wave events, as you know, uh, with fairly high um, uh, temperatures, uh, much higher than normal and little or no rainfall for quite a while and a lot of risk for wildfire and of course reduced air quality from smoke that's blown in both from the south and north and east of us. So, um, so trees can play a role in all of that um, in terms of uh, providing cooler areas uh, urban areas without trees tend to be seven to eight degrees hotter on average than the equivalent same area um, with, with that has significant tree cover like the street trees or yard trees. So it makes a, a, it makes a noticeable difference. And of course there's opportunities for shade as well, which um, where as we get into these higher and higher temperatures become increasingly important to cool off our bodies. 
So now the, the question is, who can make a good neighborhood tree ambassador? So the qualities that you need um, to, to really relish and, and be effective in the role, we think there's, there's four main things. First of all, you enjoy connecting with neighbors to share ideas and motivations and solutions about nearby trees. And um, you know, we, we find uh, that it's a great way for neighbors to uh, get to know neighbors that they never knew for any other reason. We just this past weekend on um, Sunday facilitated a neighborhood uh, private work party um, over in the woods that are just north of Lake Patton. Um, surrounded by numerous homes. And, um, and so um, those neighbors got together and we helped facilitate and bring tools and all that kind of thing. And many of them had lived you know, in the neighborhood for uh, years and years, but had never had an opportunity to meet each other. So it's a good way to, to build community. Um, and so besides enjoying connecting, um, you, uh, it's really, really great if you're open to how your unique skills and interests can create positive change. Um, it may seem a little scary to be uh, a neighborhood tree ambassador perhaps, but um, if you're open to using your skills and interests in that, um, it can be a really rewarding process. Um, and again, like I said, we've been helping others with this already and getting a lot of positive um, feedback from them about how great that they uh, enjoyed the, the stepping into that role. And of course, you'd love spending time in nature and feeling passionate about what you can do for a local environment. That's sort of a given. I imagine probably all of you that are in this call um, fit that uh, quite easily. And last but not least, you're curious and interested to learn more about significant trees and woods in your neighborhood and community. Uh, some of you may not um, even know which trees are in our local forest. We have um, lots of resources that we can point you to uh, to learn more about that. And if you ever come out from our, one of our work parties, uh, you'll also uh, learn a lot firsthand about that as well. So, whoops. So maybe you fit those criteria. Those are pretty, that's the easy criteria, I'd say. And as long as um, you're into the connection with others, uh, I would say that it, it, you know, it could very well be you. So you know, again, thanks for your interest in hearing all this tonight. We, we hope to um, engage with, with many of you, if not all of you. So now well, let's get to the kind of the nuts and bolts stuff. What can you do in your, in your neighborhood as, as part of being a neighborhood tree ambassador? The first thing is, is you can become a tree ivy spotter. So within your neighborhood, um, you can map where the invasive English ivy is that's climbing up, um, both on private tree trunks, as well as on any public lands that are in your uh, neighborhood. Now, don't get too scared about the word map. So a map could be just, you know, an address on a piece of paper or a voice note on your phone or something like that. I mean, if you want to get into, you know, pinning spots uh, on a Google map or something, you could also do that. Um, but that's a little, that's, you don't have to do that, of course. Um, but we would like to know where these spots are as you begin to sort them out so that um, in your neighborhood so that uh, we can have a database ourselves to um, go back in a later year and, and check on how the IB is doing there. So uh, becoming a tree ivy spotter could be really valuable as a first step uh, because we have over a thousand trees just in the public lands in our community of Bellingham. There's many thousands more out in the county and then on private yards uh, in particular, there's quite a bit of uh, English ivy climbing up trees. Uh, you know, we haven't inventoried it, but it's, it's hundreds, uh, if not thousands as well. And uh, businesses, often we've seen ivy climbing up on trees like that are surrounding a parking lot or things of that sort. Um, and as I said before, once the ivy gets up into the canopy, it will kill the tree. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, so, that, so the second thing you can do as a uh, tree 
uh, neighborhood ambassador uh, is to uh, find ex exceptional and heritage trees. Uh, so in other words, the larger, uh, or I should say the largest trees in your neighborhood. If you walk your neighborhood uh, to find and identify and, and again map those, but it could be again just a list of addresses um, of the exceptional heritage trees you have, that would be a big step forward because only a few neighborhoods have done that. Um, and let me just shift to the next slide for a moment. I'll come back to this. So we've, uh, we are one of the things we're working on with the city behind the scenes is to, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is, is some tree advocacy rules in the interim. And uh, one little piece of that is to add some definitions for exceptional and heritage trees. Right now, um, there's kind of an informal list with the city of Bellingham of heritage trees, but it's only in certain areas of the city. And uh, if every neighborhood could do it um, and, and nominate those for the city of Bellingham designation, that would really begin to fill out that list. And as we get into more um, tree ordinance improvements down the road, whether it's with our interim rules or with the city uh, and it's you know master plan process, um, that that definition could very well come in handy for for protecting those very special trees. Now, exceptional trees are just are a notch below that. They're 16 inches or greater uh, at um, diameter measured at breast height. So that's kind of another threshold that that will come in handy down the road um, as there's more tree uh, rules. And so this is an example of um, the simple list that's on the website address you can see at the top, which um, is what Bellingham shows. And it's actually a two page list. I've just showed in part of the first page here, but it shows several addresses of uh, prior identifications of exceptional trees. We believe that if each neighborhood association um, or, or you know, a neighborhood tree ambassador uh, steps forward to further identify more trees that would greatly broaden this list. And a few neighborhoods have already done that. Sunnyland just recently did that. And you can see the results here. This is from the Sunnyland Neighborhood Association website. And this, all these numbers key to um, trees that are identified uh, on that same web page. And then likewise, um, the York neighborhood has done uh, their own version of, their, of a tree map. Um, in their district, and uh, and again, the, all the numbers key to um, specific things, as you can see on the bottom. Um, that's about it for neighborhoods. Um, so, in terms of what's been done, we would love to see and facilitate, and we will ha be happy to facilitate every other city of Bellingham neighborhood that has not done anything like this to make such a a, um, a map. So. And with all these things here that we're talking about, um, I just want to emphasize Walk a Million Trees Project is, is here as a resource for you to help walk you through and, and um, you know, mentor you through the, all these different steps. So the idea is to identify and locate those exceptional and heritage trees, and then take it to your neighborhood association, get some other people's feedback, Maybe there's some additional trees you missed, or maybe there's some debate about certain trees. So uh, kind of sort it out with others in your neighborhood is always a good thing. And then like I showed a moment ago, um, there, there can be an effort that we can help with in terms of getting it posted on your neighborhood association website and spreading the word on your social media, whether it's your uh, own social media or um, the neighborhood association social media. And then if you submit that info to the city of Bellingham for inclusion, we can begin to broaden out that list and broaden the trees that are um, protected. So now I'm gonna move forward here to the third thing. So the third thing you could do is organize a neighborhood work party. Now I know that might sound scary. And so just wanna say, look at the bottom line in the green there after C. Walk a Million Trees Project can facilitate and help you with all those steps. Uh, like I said earlier, we did that just this past Saturday, in fact, over by um, the, the woods that are next to Lake Patton. So um, we, 
uh, so there's no need for you to have to do that on your own. We will help you. Uh, so we can do English ivy removal. Uh, there could be blackberry removal as well, which isn't directly you know, killing trees, but what it does is all the Himalayan blackberry uh, basically removes land area from potentially being planted with trees. Um, so a blackberry kind of comes in where there's been uh, you know, disturbances in the land, just like uh, English ivy. And then once the blackberry's in, there's not really a way for any uh, native tree seedlings to uh, get going in there. So blackberry removal has an indirect positive benefit as well. Um, and then uh, besides the dwarf party uh, doing those kind of tasks, and uh, it, it would be also to educate others about the how-tos. Um, if you attend our work party this weekend, uh, you, you will see hands-on uh, how to um, best remove English ivy. I will talk a little bit more about that here and, and in the Q&A afterwards, I can go into it in more detail because I know a few of you specifically were asking about that beforehand. Um, we have been doing a lot of it lately and we've done a lot of research about how to do it. So we're happy to spread the word. Um, we also um, have uh, plenty to share. And this is from our website here. I'll talk you through this a little bit later, uh, but there's steps on our website of how to remove English ivy from trees. We haven't made a video yet, but we will soon. But we have other resources on our website, like um, how to compost blackberry cuttings um, right on site so you don't have to try to figure out how to you know get them removed in your yard waste or anything like that and there's a special waffle kind of thing you can make on the ground with dead branches and sticks which is a way to solve that and so um, uh, you know again if you come to one of our work parties you'll learn very directly how to do it but even if you don't come to one of our work parties we're happy to help you um, and other ways to learn how to do these things so you, you can spread the word. Um, and then of course, the last part of a neighborhood work party process can be to celebrate your successes, even if they seem small. Maybe it's only gonna be like three or four people you get together to do a, a little tiny work party. Um, that's okay, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, if it's a small number of people and maybe say three people and a couple hours save you know, six or 10 trees with, from ivy, let's say, that's, a, that's, that's huge. So don't discount the small efforts. Um, it's, you know, all the small efforts and successes uh, add up to a lot over time. So now, um, so the fourth thing then is to, that you can do in your neighborhood is organize a seedling rescue planting party. Now this is a little different than an invasive removal thing. We have been um, beginning to work with numerous people to rescue unwanted tree seedlings, conifer tree seedlings, and big leaf maple seedlings that pop up typically in, in certain areas of the city, um, usually on the edges of some existing small forest areas. And, um, uh, and if we'll, we're happy to show you how to properly rescue those, in other words, when they're about two years old, about a foot to two feet tall, how to dig them out okay, you know, when to do that for the right time of year, um, and how to pot them properly so that they can then be either given to others in your neighborhood or they can be brought to us to be used in our planting projects. So, um, uh, so there's much that can be done with those seedlings. There's no reason to be going out and buying at least for the kind of you know conifer treat native conifers we have, no reason to go out and buy those when there's plenty popping up. Also, we can help walk you through the process of applying for a City of Bellingham Small and Simple uh, grant, which can be as high as five thousand dollars. They do those each year. I believe the deadline is roughly in May in each year, and that's uh, what Sunnyland did uh, to hold a neighborhood tree celebration, which is on the next line that they did uh, in the spring, it was on Earth Day. And there's no reason that other neighborhoods can't do that as well, uh, especially with that grant supporting the process. That grant enabled them to uh, 
not only hold the event, but to purchase um, some trees to give away to residents and, and then also assistance from us to plant those trees. So it was a, it was a whole day of, of um, tree celebration in various ways. And again, we can help you with all that. We're very happy to do that. Then the fifth thing is to advocate for trees in your neighborhood. So begin to, you know, to notice and discuss um, you know, with your neighbors what's going on with your trees. As you start to tune into that, uh, I, I imagine you will see more and more. Um, also, uh, you can track nearby proposed developments. Developments only have to uh, notify residents within uh, 500 yards. Um, but uh, there's a city uh, website page which lists all proposed developments uh, that have been proposed to the city of Bellingham, for instance. And you can begin to uh, early on, if you can, uh, give feedback to the developers and to the city so that there is a uh, tree focused review as part of the review process. And we're doing that with as I mentioned earlier, the Mud Bay Cliffs project and potentially with the Meridian project as well uh, right now. But that's something that besides us, it's, it's really great if the neighborhood gets involved with such efforts. And then you can educate neighbors about applicable tree rules. So, um, and we're happy to help you with this. This is an example, you know, so right now, if you go to the city of Bellingham website, it's a pretty complicated about as to what rules apply to what. And then they have this wonderful chart, which actually we uh, borrowed from a presentation they made earlier this year just to the city council. And this chart they use internally in their staff, but I actually think there's a, a number of things here which would be uh, useful to understand for the general public. And we're gonna be working on some more documentation ourselves for this for the public as well. But anyways, we'll, we can walk you through all that so that you can become knowledgeable about um, the different kinds of lands that might be in your neighborhood and what rules do or don't apply to it. Um, that, that's really useful information and one of the kinds of questions that we get um, from, uh, quite often from people. And then the last thing is that you can report unauthorized tree removals. Um, the city uh, has a phone number for that, um, which is <laughs> very hard to find. Um, and I'm sorry to say, I, I should have put it here, but I don't have it here. But if you uh, email us, we can get that to you um, and point you to the webpage um, that's uh, associated with that. Uh, it, you know, typically the process is right now, since there aren't any tree regulations about, that really affect uh, unauthorized tree removals in an, in an effective way, Usually it's that you hear the chainsaw and then you begin to realize that there's a gap somewhere. And that's unfortunately after the fact, but, um, uh, but if, if, you know, there's many circumstances where uh, local tree removal professionals have um, gone ahead and cut trees even without uh, the necessary permit if, if that was applicable. Um, so, there's, uh, it's good to be eyes and ears for your neighborhood regarding trees. This is also can apply to um, street trees and public works uh, efforts with street trees as well. Uh, sometimes there has been uh, removals of street trees that the residents didn't know much about. So if you get involved with that uh, and track that a little more uh, with our help, um, then your neighborhood can uh, provide more feedback and hopefully um, advocate for the trees. So then if you, the final thing is to widen your tree focus if you're interested. So besides your neighborhood uh, focus, you can volunteer at a fun Walk a Million Trees work party in parks and greenways that we hold. Um, you can see in the black there under that line, the menu directories that to get to that page where you can sign up. All of our work party dates are always listed on that work parties page for the you know, upcoming month or two. And it's a simple checkbox form and you give your name and an email address and you get automatically notified. Or if you aren't sure which date um, you're interested in, there's another checkbox on the form where 
you um, can just say, put me on an on-call list to be occasionally emailed no notified for future work party dates. We have about 300 people on that on that on-call list now, and we're, more and more people are uh, going on it over time. Um, and our work parties, though, are re relatively small scale intentionally. Most of the ones we do on our own are like 20 to 25 people at most. Um, sometimes we coordinate with the city and have kind of a joint work party with the city uh, or NC or, or other you know, nonprofits uh, locally that are involved with trees. And that's when uh, the, the sizes can be a little bit bigger. So that's one way to widen your tree focus. Uh, you'll learn a lot at those work parties, um, uh, but also you can learn more about native trees and plants. And uh, we can point you to a number of resources um, to learn more. Uh, there's plenty, I and mean, if you just actually just Google native trees and plants for you know, Whatcom County, um, you'll come to several sites that are just um, terrific about that. Uh, you also, there's also the county's noxious uh, weed website, um, which has a lot of data about uh, invasive plants, uh, including English ivy. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, as the city's urban forestry management plan process continues on um, and has opportunities for feedback, it's really important to give that feedback. Um, that's the only way to, um, to really uh, massage and, and impact what policymakers may decide about that plan. So I encourage that strongly. Uh, and last but not least, you can support a volunteer for our efforts in, in tree protection. We've got numerous tree protection efforts, ranging from working in, uh, to protect trees from being logged in our Lake Whatcom watershed uh, to um, uh, tree protection rules that'll be updated for uh, the uh, county. And then also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, we're, we're working behind the scenes, trying to see if we can get the city interested in interim uh, tree rules until they have their full uh, management plan process completed. We were involved in a lot of different projects. So if you do want to get involved with us, you can see the wide variety of things we're trying to, that, we, that either we're trying to get going over time or that we already are doing. Um, and what we've been talking about tonight covers a couple of these boxes, but there's even more that we do. Uh, and so in summary, there's six ways you can do that. And again, I just wanna emphasize, we're happy to facilitate and help you with all the above. You know, the, our uh, email address is at the bottom or you can give us a call and we will work with each of you in a custom way to uh, fulfill your needs um, about that. And if you wanna participate in other ways with us, of course, if you don't if you choose to donate to us, uh, that helps to help us helps us plant trees locally, and we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so uh, it's tax deductible. Uh, and then you can sign up for our newsletter to find out about our events and progress if you aren't already on our newsletter. And like I mentioned earlier, there's work parties to help us plant and save trees. And then on the admin side of things, if you have a special admin skill, like maybe you're a terrific writer or you're uh, you know, have some social media skills or video skills or things of that sort, we'd love to have you chip in on our team. Uh, most of our, we're an all volunteer organization. We have about eight core admin volunteers besides our 300 planting volunteers. Um, and we're always looking for new talents. Uh, all, all the volunteers on our admin side are, you know, basically ch chipping in a couple hours a week at, at most, uh, you know, there's one or two that are doing more like five to 10 hours. And then there's me, uh, I'm doing uh, near full time. So, um, so it doesn't take a lot of time and we're, um, we all work remotely. Uh, and we've done that since we started in COVID and we just are continuing on that way. And it seems to work pretty well for us. We have a, um, uh, a, a chat app that we use to coordinate within the team. Um, and so 
uh, it, it can be a lot of fun and a lot of um, satisfying work. Um, but it doesn't, you know, if you have, if there's weeks that you can't work on it and stuff, that's, that's all fine. We have lots of flexible timing with, with almost all of our needs. And then if you are interested on the donate side, on our website, if you go to our donate page, you can see all the various ways you can donate without really giving any money out of your pocket, so to speak, because there's things like Amazon Smile and um, you know this savings account at Atmos, and just uh, those are two that don't cost you a thing. Um, that just you know your regular Amazon orders, a half a percent of those would go to Walk a Million Trees project uh, without adding any cost to you. Um, or you can choose to round up the change for your credit card purchases or debit card purchases. So we have all those kinds of details on our website. Uh, you can do a birthday fundraiser on Facebook or, or on crowdfunding sites. Uh, so there's a, a lot of ways to uh, help our effort if you um, feel strongly about it uh, without um, having to uh, you know, write a large check or anything like that. These are all small incremental ways. Last but not least, I just wanna say making an impact isn't about one person taking one big action. It's about a community of like-minded people coming together and taking small local actions every day. That's what this is really about here. And then that's what we're trying to do with Walk a Million Trees Project is to build a community movement of tree lovers who are all doing their part one tree at a time. And that's, that's what we need now in this time of, of climate and biodiversity crises is that kind of locally based uh, action, uh, which doesn't rely on waiting for national policymakers or anything like that. It's something that we can take in our own hands and it's very satisfying and builds hope. Uh, I get people all the time that come to our work parties coming up to me afterwards and saying just how grateful they are that they could help out because it gives them some hope and, and just a better, um, you know, a more optimistic look at the crises that we're now facing uh, in our world. So if you wanna reach out to me, uh, this is the contact info. If you do sign up for our newsletter, which is, uh, there's a button for that on many of the pages of our website, including our homepage. You'll also get a terrific free bonus, which is a Whatcom Tree Planting and Care Guide, which is actually a multiple page um, e-document that uh, we developed together with uh, local arborists and landscapers. Um, and it goes into quite a bit of uh, detail about how to properly plant and care for um, trees. Um, and also gives you lots of resources of where to um, economically um, uh, find tree seedlings uh, for your yard or for elsewhere. So I'm gonna stop the screen share now. And um, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Hi, Michael. It's Francis here. Yes. Hi, Francis. Great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, could you just go back to the slide? Um, I wanted to see what the definition of a mature, a heritage tree is. Oh, sure. Okay. And I also noticed someone has a question about how ivy um, decreases um strength of trees in the chat oh yes i see that now yeah thank you okay so um so the first one uh was uh, about uh the definition of heritage trees so let me screen share again we'll go back to that um that one okay let me just uh step back here All right, here we are. Can you, is it, do you see that, uh, Francis? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So um, different cities. So the, the recommendations we've been working on behind the scenes are all based uh, and founded on numerous uh, tree protection ordinances in numerous other Washington cities. And there's, um, you know, they use different wording sometimes, but uh, basically this is kind of a consensus of, of what's um, been established. So the heritage tree 
doesn't have a specific age definition, but it's um, but the key is is that it's especially notable as a mature tree due to its size or uniqueness or historic interest. So that's why that that's what led to all the trees on you find it here on this list uh, from earlier efforts was that they were especially notable uh, in that way. There's no uh, it's not like they're all um, you know, 100 years older or that kind of thing. Many of them are older than, than that, but it's not a hard criteria for a heritage tree since it's more about the neighborhoods and communities perception of that tree than it is uh, about any technical definition. Does that answer your question, Francis, or did you, was there something else you were wondering about that? No, that helps, thanks. Okay, great. And then, uh, you know, the exceptional tree definition earlier, uh, that's in the middle there, that's, that is a specific diameter. And that's, uh, so the reason why we're working to add a, a definition like that to the city's uh, tree review vocabulary, so to speak, is so that the more, the larger, more mature trees that are being affected by developments can be focused on in a more uh, intensive way than just the, what they have now, which is just the top definition of a significant tree, just any tree six inches or greater. So it's a way to segment out the, the especially important trees on any given site um, as part of a review process for a development. Okay, and then let's see. Um, oh, and then how does ivy uh, decrease the tree strength? Good question. So, um, uh, so as it begins to climb up the bark, um, it is um, it basically, it has little roots that are attaching to the bark with kind of a glue-like substance. And in fact, if you look at older uh, English ivy roots, you'll see kind of this hairy little mass that's kind of coming out from the root, which can be, you know, as thick as, you know, like a quarter or, or larger. And, um, uh, and so it is, um, sucking out um, moisture from the outer bark area during that time. So that's, that's, that's diminishing and weakening the tree a bit, but not enough to kill it. And you won't notice much, you know, damage or, you know, or, or early withering or anything like that. Um, so it's really when it gets up to the canopy though, after a couple of years, depending on the size of the tree, that that's when it begins to take over things. And when it gets on the canopy, then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's doomsday there because it's outcompetes the canopy for sunlight and uh, also begins to basically, uh, you know, cover and strangulate the, the, the smaller branches that are up there. Does that, uh, Audrey, does that answer your question? Audrey, are you here? Well, that was Audrey's uh, question, and I'm not sure if she's still here. <laughs> okay, well, any other questions from anybody? I see your note, Charles, let's see. Yes, we need to elevate and manage uh, this climate crisis that we're in. Well, you know, we're beginning, it's becoming much more real now for us in the Whatcom County area and, and Bellingham as well. Um, it's not hypothetical, you know, we're experiencing the floods and the heat dome events and the smoke. So we're not immune from it, even though this corner of the Pacific Northwest is a wonderful place to be and less, and less impacted than some other places of the world. We're, we're impacted as well. And that'll be increasingly true over time. Uh, the wildfire issue will begin to become more important uh, as things get drier and hotter. And like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the show, um, I'll say it one more time in case you missed it, uh, in early October, on October 5th and October 10th in the evenings, we're part of the Pickford's October series of events that goes on all month. And uh, we'll be showing the film Elemental, which is all about redefining our relationship to wildfires. And uh, it's a, just an amazing, amazing film um, and very um, informative about, and then breaks through a lot of preconceptions about what you might think be, would be the way to, um, uh, to protect the house 
from wildfire. Uh, you know, the, the most common preconception people have is that, well, you gotta remove trees as far as you can all the way around the house. And actually in a major wildfire event, that's actually not the most important factor. So it's one of the things that we like to show to this community um, as a way to um, show that you don't have to uh, remove so many trees and that actually the fire uh, safe movement involves other steps that are more important than that. So uh, we hope you can come out for that. that. That'll be another piece of kind of the climate emergency that we're facing in this community. Um, any other questions? You can either turn on your sound or, or put it in the chat. Well, I don't have a question, but just thanks for all the great information. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming to the work party on Sunday. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, we so it's not, and just to talk a little more about that work party, we so be at Whatcom Falls Park. Uh, if you signed up for it on our website, um, then you will get an email with uh, this specific place in Whatcom Falls Park and all the detailed directions. But for the, you know, but basically it's going to be very on the trail that's very near the old. Uh, railroad trestle uh, there in the middle of the park. So that's where we're going to be um, uh, working on a whole batch of trees there, mature trees that have English ivy climbing up it. So we'll go through all the ivy removal steps. Um, does anyone, if you want to, I, I can talk through in more detail right now the ivy removal steps. Again, it's best to see it hands on at the work party. But I, I'm, if anyone wants to hear it now, I can talk, talk you through for it just take a few minutes uh, of what actually to do with English Ivy. If you want to hear that, why don't you either raise your hand or say yes or something. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll do that for a couple more minutes and then maybe we'll call it a night after that. All right, I'm seeing a couple hands. So yeah, let's do that. So like I said, first of all, all these steps I'm gonna talk about are um, on our website um, and uh, but um, uh, so, so, so here's the verbal version. And someday soon we hope to have a, a video version as well. So you wanna wear garden gloves to protect yourself, first of all, from the gluey substance that's on the English ivy that is, gets exuded at its roots. Um, and also um, keep an eye and ear out for any hornets nests to avoid. Uh, we've run into a, a few hornets along the way after doing a lot of English ivy. And it's not that the hornets are gravitating to the English ivy, but it's sometimes just there's other plants and bushes that might be nearby which where, where there are hornets. So th those are two safety cautions in the beginning just to understand. And then um, the other key thing to understand is, is if the ivy is climbing the tree trunk, it is English ivy. You may be wondering, are there other ivies that you might see in your yard or elsewhere that, um, you know, are they gonna climb tree trunks? And the pattern is, or is, or the tendency is, is that no, they do not climb tree trunks. It's just the English ivy that does, at least in the Pacific Northwest. So now um, the goal is, that, or the first main step of action is, um, uh, is to clip around the tree trunk at anywhere from shoulder to waist level height, um, high enough. So we often do it uh, ourselves at, at shoulder height so that we can spot from a distance how that ivy is doing and, and see visually very easily if any more ivy will come up in a later year. But it can be as low as waist height, that kind of thing. The main thing is to get every single root all the way around the tree. And for thinner vine, ivy vines, a simple little garden hand clipper pruner will work fine, just the same kind you use in a regular you know, yard work. Um, if it's old, well-established ivy, those roots will be bigger, like I mentioned, sometimes as big as a quarter or, or larger. And so you can either use a lopper, which is a big handled uh, clipper, basically, um, or if you have a little uh, handsaw, um, uh, you know, one of those little single vein tall saws, um, or even a regular wood hand saw, you can use that if it's like in your yard. Um, that would be a way to cut those larger roots more easily. Um, and so then you make the cut all the way around. 
And then from wherever that cut line is, again, whether it's shoulder height or, or a little bit lower, you gently peel down and remove the vines from the tree, trying to minimize damage to the tree's bark. Um, and the main thing is to check for any small ivy strands under the moss or the bark fragments as you're peeling down. Sometimes there can be additional little roots working their way up that are coming up, like especially with like, you know, Douglas firs that have very thick bark and you know lots of grooving and everything in it. So there can be a lot, there can be ivy coming up underneath as well, or, or in the in the little wedges, so to speak, of the bark. So now, so that's all below the line. Then above the line, you can leave all that ivy. The magical thing about all this is, is that to save the tree, you don't have to be a tree climber. You don't need any, you know, to do anything dangerous like that. All the higher ivy strands, once you have cut them correctly, you know, at that lower shoulder or waist height level, they will die and decompose over the following year and eventually fall off the tree. In fact, it's actually kind of, I find it's kind of fun to watch that process over the year because it feels real satisfying. It's like, wow, I, you know, it's all happening and, and, and you know, we did that. <laughs> so, um, so now that you've peeled the ivy down, the next step is to focus on the ivy that's on the ground immediately surrounding the tree. If possible, the goal that we use is to clear about a six foot perimeter around each tree's base. But on some really rugged sites, like the site that we had this past Saturday, it was really difficult because there's also there was, on that site there was you know timber down and all sorts of things, you know, other bushes and blackberry and stuff. So um, so the, the idea is to remove everything you can, that's especially close to the tree. Um, and then also, um, uh, you know, as you, you, with the ivy on the ground, you can pull up. And as you pull up, it begins to, you know, just from its strands, it tends to, you know, pull up in long pieces. So um, that begins to lift out its, its shallow, relatively shallow roots. Um, and then you can clip those pieces into like several arm length or smaller pieces. Um, and you just basically repeat that for all the ground level ivy around the tree. And just looking very carefully at the base of the tree to see if there's any other, you know, pieces or remnants moving upward uh, or, or coming up or pointing towards the base. Um, be careful though, as you, as you pull out ivy roots, especially on some of the larger pieces that you, or minimizing damage to the uh, tree's surface roots. Those are really important for the tree's health as well. Uh, you don't want to be like, you know, just ripping things up like that because that can um, hurt the tree as well. Um, and then, um, so if you can't clear six feet, the idea is to clear what you can, and then either you or we or your neighborhood group or whatever will all. Can, can revisit the site at a later point, maybe next year, as I say, and just monitor um, what's happening with the trees that you helped out. Uh, if you did clear about six feet around, you should be good for at least a couple years, if not longer. Uh, English ivy, you know, of course, is on the ground in lots of areas, um, you know, besides climbing trees. It's an invasive on the ground as well, although it's, I guess, in a way, perhaps just in, at least in the tree context, less objectionable <laughs> being on the ground. But if you just chip away at removing it entirely on the ground, like from your yard, let's say, and replacing it with some other kind of ground cover that's, that's native and um, not, in, not harmful to trees, that can be um, a, 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 you know, further steps to do over time. But the main thing right now, the most urgent thing is to get the trees totally, I mean, get the ivy totally removed in a circle and peeled down um, from the height we're talking about. So now the final or almost final step um, is you might be wondering, okay, well, what do I do with all these ivy pieces I removed? So if it's just a single tree or two in your yard, you can bag the cut vines, uh, ideally in co compostable bags if you have those, and put it in your yard waste bin if you have that curbside service. Um, the main thing is do not casually compost ivy like in your compost bin because that will that often does not work. Um, there's usually often not enough heat to, to uh, affect that ivy. 
So, but many of you may have, or, or working in the neighborhood context, you may have a little cluster or, or little forest edge of trees where there's ivy um, that also has substantial ivy on the ground um, that's not gonna be removed, at least for now. So if you're in that kind of context, you got another alternative besides bagging. And that is to um, hang the cut ivy pieces on top of the ground level ivy that's away from the trees or even on top of the bushes. Um, the main thing is to get it well away from the trees and to have those ivy pieces up in the air. That's the main thing. Uh, because what will happen is over the next following months, those ivy pieces will decay and die quickly due to air exposure. And, um, and we've been um, monitoring, we've been, we've been checking with the county, not just we um, uh, uh, board about uh, this process and they have several documented examples of this occurring successfully up in North County. And then we've been doing it as well so far successfully and we visited those sites uh, already and um, are seeing the, the ivy uh, beginning to decay uh, successfully. Now, the thing is, if you're throwing it on top of other ground ivy, even if a small amount of that ivy that you cut did happen to reroot, um, it's not a big deal because it's already where the ivy is. So it's a way to kind of get around this big removal issue, um, especially in the forest context. So that's, that's basically all there is to it in terms of ivy removal. The, the, the only other thing we ask is, is if you do begin to remove ivy from trees, we would love to hear from you about that because we're trying to, like I mentioned earlier, create a database of where the ivy is on what trees and which trees still have it and which trees have been removed. And we're trying to track all of that so that we all collectively can see how many trees we're saving and also uh, successfully come back to those trees at a later point to check on them. So any other questions? Let's see here. I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you for coming tonight on such a beautiful night. I appreciate that you attended. And our website has a lot more info, so feel free to go and browse there again and take care. And I will turn off the recording now. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.